okay welcome everybody so welcome to our video series on machine elements uh, design of machine elements and machine components so this is going to focus on shaft design Um, so here is the outline. So we're going to talk a little bit briefly about shafts uh, and discuss about loads and shafts, talk about stress concentration and kind of talk a little bit about some design considerations that you would need to use. So if you're just joining us, so the book we are using is chapter, this is basically in chapter 10 in the machine elements in mechanical design, fifth edition by Robert Mott. Um, so if you are using a different book, the idea itself would be similar but you need to cross reference and figure out how things are working out and so on. Okay, so the shaft itself, what happens is when you basically have different admission components that aren't aligned, you need to transmit power from one point to the other. So imagine like a shaft being like this, um, like this pen over here. Um, so what happens is you're going to put power on one side. So this is going to basically be starting to rotate. So like with the cap, you can kind of see, so it's kind of starting to rotate. And you might be taking the power out from another side. So essentially, because it's going to be rotating, your shaft is um, most likely going to be circular or kind of have a circular symmetry. So if you ever stick your head under the truck, don't do it when it's moving, obviously. So you would notice that there is power in the engine that basically goes from the engine to the rear wheel. So because the engine is kind of somewhere over here and the wheels are somewhere over here, you basically need some kind of a device or some um, like a structure which basically transmits power from the engine to the rear wheel. Same thing happens if you're any, um, like if you're interested, you can kind of Google and see propeller shafts. Those are like huge, so it's humongous. So typically maybe like a meter, meter and a half or even wider. Um, and the other thing is basically you might have shafts inside gearbox, which basically link one gear to the other. So the shaft itself appears in a lot of places and now we're going to look at how we will actually design these things. Uh, since they rotate, obviously they need to be circular or some kind of a cross circular cross section. Um, so they could potentially be splined or uh, key. So let's look at some, uh, what are the considerations that you need to do once you have these shafts. So this is kind of a simple shaft. So imagine um, this is basically a gear over here. This is basically the symbol for the gear. Um, so this would be the teeth of the gear and then you would basically have belts over here. So the belt basically is kind of like coming out of the screen like so. And here you would need to have another interfacing gear like this, right? So this basically the power could basically be transferred from here to this gear and then from the gear, the power needs to go into the shaft and then from the shaft, it needs to travel all the way to this guy. And then from here, it's going to go out uh, through this belt drive over here. So this kind of gives you kind of an illustration of how the power flow itself looks, but this might be potentially how the, uh, the setup looks. These guys over here, this is the bearing. Right, so this is a symbol for the bearing. So what typically happens is you're basically going to assume that this is actually simply supported. So this is basically equivalent of having a beam like so. So that basically this is basically free to rotate in either direction. So that's the assumption that goes when you're having the bearing because basically because you have um, other things in the bearing like the, um, the actual support ball bearing and so on. So we can basically uh, approximate the ball bearing itself to be a simply supported structure. So when you have a structure like this, we need to think about how the forces actually get transmitted. So anytime you want to transmit this power, there needs to be some kind of a force and a torque that's associated. Ideally, we'd like to have pure torsion, but that is not always the case. So basically when you try to apply torsion, you're also kind of applying force. So that needs to be balanced out in your shaft. So here is how it looks. So basically imagine there is a gear mating on the other side. So you might have one, uh, member that's applying a force in this direction. Um, there might be another member which is applying force in this direction. So then what you need to do is we need to actually resolve these forces along some global um, x, y or x, z direction. 
So once that happens, we'll basically create the moments, uh, create the bending moment diagram. Um, so depending on the direction you choose, you can choose um, basically the shaft direction to be either X or Z. So based on that, the equations might change a little bit. So anyway, but nonetheless, what happens is once you create the bending moment diagram in the two axes, you can basically calculate the resultant moment as the square root of the sum of the squares. So this is similar to the resultant of the force. So once this happens, uh, we can basically calculate and then just as we did with the bending analysis, using the moment, you can calculate the stress and then we can basically design the shaft to ensure that it doesn't fail under that stress. So let's look at some of the loads in the shaft. So when you transmit power, P, um, which is the power in horsepower, uh, would basically be given by this equation if you're using SI units. I'm big my pardon. So if you're using SI units, the power is basically torque times the omega. So T is the torque, omega is the angular velocity in radians per second. But unfortunately, we use imperial units. So our equation changed to 63,000 times power by N is the value for the torque. So N is in revolutions per minute, P is in horsepower. So the torsion is usually assumed constant. However, if the power changes, the torsion would also change. So that's the thing you need to keep in mind. So here is what we assume. We assume that all gears, um, like let's look at what happens. So all gears, belts and chains actually apply some kind of a transverse load. When you use helical gears, worm gears, they additionally apply an axial load as well. So generally, when you have a repeated load, uh, we look at this eventually. Um, basically, when you have this bending load, it actually, uh, the transverse load, it actually app applies a repeated and reversed bending. So this is due to the rotation. So essentially, if you have this part, so this is always like flexing it this way. And the transverse forces also results in a repeated and reverse, but this is a shear force. Typically, we consider the shear force only at the location where the bending moment is, is zero. So this is important. If you have both bending and shear at any location in your beam, you neglect the effect of the shear force. However, if there is only pure shear force, you will have to actually do a design so that your um, the beam can resist the shear force. Typically, if you have multiple gears, you might have to resolve them in the x, y, and the x, z uh, direction. So based on the direction of your x axis. So let's look at uh, what actually happens. So imagine you have this um, shaft like so, the blue one over here, and then the red circle over here is some spot that we are interested in. So you, you can imagine you're still standing on the, uh, on the shaft and then see what actually happens when it rotates. Um, that as the thing rotates, you're gonna experience the tension at the top it becomes zero when it's close to the neutral axis and then when it go goes back down it's going to be compressive and then when it comes back up it's going to be tensile again. So you basically experience repeated and reversed bending. So when you have gears, so we already talked about this in the gear design, so the force of interaction between the two gears like so is going to be along the normal direction. So this basically has a tangential component which actually produces the torque and then you're going to also have a normal component which is also going to um, basically just as a normal force. So what does that mean? So essentially the gear over here is basically kind of like pushing it down like so. And this gear, it, um, this basically gets resolved along this direction and this direction. What we essentially do is move this force from the cent uh, from the edge to the center of the gear and the distance between the two would correspond to the torque that the gear is producing. Right? So basically we can use this formula over here. The tangential force can be calculated in terms of the power and the diameter. The radial force is calculated as a tan of the pressure angle and then the direction of the force um, the tangential force, it basically opposes the direction of motion in the driving gear and then it is along the direction of motion in the other gear. So the net force, if you are interested in doing some um, slightly different calculation, um, the net force is basically 
so the net force if you're doing some calculation is basically given by this formula over here this is the normal force uh, and you can potentially in, uh, use this equation to actually resolve the forces and redo the calculation so let's look at uh, belts now so for belts you basically have slack side where we neglecting the weight um, you basically assume that there is no force um, in uh, sorry this is for chains so the slack side there is no force if you neglect the weight the torque still has the same formula so on the tight side the equation is basically given by uh, T is 63,000 P over N right so then basically we can give the force as the torque divided by the radius which is half the diameter um, this is a different per angle over here uh, basically you can assume that this angle basically this angle over here basically you can assume this to be very very small uh, so once you do that uh, you basically can approximate that the force is hull horizontal and that FC is approximately equal to um, the FCX is approximately equal to FC so let's look at belts now so when you have belts the only thing we know is that the force of interaction, um, the net driving force, is going to be F1 minus F2. So this is F1 and F2. Um, basically, we kind of assume for the belts that F1 over F2 is 5. So this is for V belts. So this basically, this relation allows you to calculate the horizontal force. So basically, the belt of the F force like is basically uh, becomes 1.5 times Fn. For flat belt, basically you actually have a higher tension. So that basically means that um, the FB is going to be 2 times T divided by the radius. Okay, so now we've gone through um, kind of calculating the basics, so we've given you the outline. So now let's go ahead and actually do some couple of simple problems. So we're going to basically calculate the torque that's needed to transmit 100 horsepower at um, 1000 rpm 50 hours horsepower at 2500 rpm so if you're basically using a gear with 36 teeth pd equal to 12 uh, is used to transmit 50 horsepower at 2500 rpm um, what would be the tangential and radial force uh, if basically this is going to be the center of a simply supported beam we're going to calculate the maximum bending moment again keep in mind the third is kind of a made-up problem so you would need to have at least uh, a gear and a belt or two gear basically power coming in needs to be going out of the system but nonetheless this will be a useful exercise to figure out what actually happens in terms of just the forces alone so at this point i'd recommend that you pause the video and solve try to solve this yourself okay so let's assume you have solved it uh, so let's look at the first two problems alone so we have our formula which basically says t is 63,000 p over n so substituting P as uh, 100 horsepower and N as 1000 RPM, this basically gives us 63,000 times 100 divided by 1000, which is 6300. So this is basically um, in pound inch. Do the same thing here, we get 1260 pound inch. So for the gear, the first thing we need to do is actually calculate the diameter. So the diameter is given by the number of teeth divided by the diametral pitch which is given to be 12 so we do that we get 3 inches next we'll calculate the tangential force which basically if you recall is 1 2 6 followed by three zeros times power divided by the rpm times the diameter so when we substitute all these values in we get 840 pounds we do the same thing the normal force is the tangential force times the tan of the pressure angle phi which is 20 degrees if unless otherwise given you can assume it's 20 degrees so if we do that uh, we basically find that the radial force is 305.74 pounds so proceeding to the next step of the problem so this is our simply supported beam that we had previously um, so here we need to first calculate uh, the reaction forces so basically the reaction force can be given at one end um, it's going to be inversely pro the proportional to the opposite diameter or uh, opposite distance over here so we can calculate r1 and r2 like so the maximum bending moment is going to be um, the reaction force times the corresponding distance 
So this basically becomes f times d1 d2 divided by d1 plus d2. So once you have that, let's calculate the effect of the radial force. Um, that basically becomes 573 pound inches. Do the same thing for the um, tangential force. That becomes 1575 pound inches. So next what we do is basically calculate the resultant, which is going to be the sum square root of the sum of these two squares. So once you do that, we get the moment total is going to be 1676.08 pounds, which is basically going to occur at the location of the force. Again, if you have multiple components, the location of the maximum moment might change based on your um, the, um, the shear force and bending moment diagram, you might have to redo and then kind of locate uh, by including the stress concentration, all of the other things. Proceeding next, the important concept is going to be the stress concentration in shafts. So generally what happens is um, in order to kind of create the shaft, you would end up having sharp, uh, sharp corners. So you typically need to locate the shafts uh, in order for the shaft to actually get power or transmit power to gears and pulleys you need to actually have keys. And then you also have retaining rings to hold the well, uh, hold the gears and uh, um, the sprockets in place. And generally the shaft is going to be a ductile material. Um, and then torsion is basically assumed to be constant. So this is basically assuming that the total power transmitted remains constant. So KT is generally not applied to um, the torsion. Bending and vertical shear due to transverse load is always repeated in reverse. So you need to apply KT um, apply, is always applied to um, torsion and shear. So let's look at the other things. So or like look at one by one. So basically keys are longitudinal things that are cut in the shaft. So you can refer to chapter 11 for keys. There are basically two types of keys. Profile keys which appear in the middle of the shaft and sledge keys which appear in the end. So more generally your shaft almost always is going to be um, somewhere in the middle. So you end up using a profile key. Um, the nominal stress concentration um, for initial design, you can basically assume for profile key KT is two, for sledge keys KT is 1.6. So this is applied to the full diameter. That is it basically you don't um, consider the bottom of the key when you're actually doing this calculation. Moving on. So the other thing that comes in is what's known as shoulders. So shoulders are basically used or allow you to locate your gear. So essentially you can imagine your gear um, basically kind of butting here at this point. So you're going to have the bottom of the gear like so. This is going to be the other part of the gear. So this basically kind of allows you to locate the gear, right? So we would use that. So on one end over here, this is going to have typically a sharp radius. So for your initial design, you can basically assume that the radius is 0 0.03 R over D, which gives you a KT value of 2.5. And then sometimes you'd use what's known as a rounded fillet. Again, it's a design decision, but if you need to use a rounded fillet here, you need to make your gears a little bit different. So you need to provide some relief on the gear. So generally, unless if the stress is very large, you might actually try to make it rounded fillet. But generally, you can assume that the shoulder is basically a sharp fillet and then use KT value of 2.5. If it's a rounded fillet, KT value becomes 1.5. So moving on, the next thing that's used is when you want to locate or do something with the gear to prevent it from moving, um, you use what's known as a retaining ring. So when you have the retaining ring, so essentially your shaft would end up looking like this, like so. So you put the gear over here and then you put a ring over here, right? So this will basically prevent the gear from kind of going out. So when you do this, you're going to basically cut this gear or this location. So what you do is you apply a KT, which is uh, going to be value three, but this actually corresponds to the inner diameter over here, right? So this is previously your inner diameter. Let's use red. So this inner diameter is what you calculate with this formula. Uh, and then you basically apply a factor of 1.06 to calculate the final outer diameter. Okay, so this would be your basic steps for your shaft design. 
So based on the gear engagement, you will basically have an idea of how the forces are acting on the shaft. So once you have that, you can basically assume that the shaft direction uh, in this basically uh, is assumed to be the Z direction. So you'll basically create a shear force and bending moment diagram along the X, Z and the X, Y direction. So essentially, um, you, if you imagine this is kind of a transverse plane of your shaft, so your shaft is going to be over here. So this is the Z direction coming out of the plane. Um, so you can basically think of this being the, the Y and this is the X plane. So you're basically going to be creating the, the shear force and bending moment diagram for forces here like so and for forces like this. So once you have that, you can basically calculate the resultant moments at different locations. And then typically your points of interest would be close to your gear shafts and pulleys. So what will basically happen is we can, or rather we can also similarly create a torsion diagram and then we can calculate the resultant forces. Um, so the bending that results from the transverse loading is going to always be repeated and reversed. The torsion is going to be assumed to be constant unless the power is fluctuating. So if the power is fluctuating, the torsion is also varying and in which case you would have to apply your um, stress concentration factor on the torsion as well. So proceeding on, so the next step that we would need is basically um, kind of grow the step further to give the actual formulas itself. So we'll assume the one Mises criterion for failure. So we'd assume that the effective stress, that the one Mises stress is going to be given by this scary looking formula. Uh, it becomes easier when you try to actually resolve the fluctuating and the mean component into two components. So essentially, if you're able to do that, um, if you have the multi-axial stress, this is the formula. So the one Mises mean stress is given by the mean stress along direction one plus mean square of that plus mean stress along direction two minus sigma one M, sigma two M, and then the square root of that. Similarly, if you look at, do the same thing for the alternating stress, you get the one Mises alternating stress. So this is, where life becomes maybe a little bit easier. So essentially what happens is you can kind of imagine you're freezing the frame and you can basically do all your resolutions in any particular directions. And then if you're able to calculate your sigma one and sigma two, so imagine you're only applying the mean stress, calculate your sigma one and sigma two, you're only applying your alternating stress, you would calculate sigma one and sigma two, and then effectively do your calculation based on that to calculate your one Macy stress. So once you have the one Macy stress, we basically need to compare it. Um, the, uh, the mean component gets compared to the yield stress and the varying component gets compared to the endurance strength of the material. So let's recall calculating the endurance limit. Um, so basically this is from section 5.4. Uh, we would basically use the ultimate stress from there uh, for materials either 1040, 4140 and so on. Uh, basically, we need to have elongation of 12%. So, but once you have this SU, you can basically look at table 5.8 uh, to get the value of SN. This is the ideal value, assuming there is no correction factor. We're going to be assuming it's cold, drawn, or machined. So, we're going to assume this is cold, drawn, or machined when you're looking at the chart over here. Um, the material is typically steel, so we're going to assume the material factor is 1. Since it's going to be repeated and reversed, the ST is going to be 1. Uh, so once you do that, we typically assume like a 99% reliability, which gives us CR of 0 0.81. The size we don't initially know. So we're going to assume that the diameter of the shaft is less than 4 inches, which allows us to basically pick a value of CS is us. 0.75. If you do the calculation and you find the shaft is larger, you will have to go back and substitute a new value of CS and then redo your calculation. So once you have this, you can basically calculate the endurance strength SN prime as basically SN that you calculated for the ideal material times 0.81 times 0.75. So that will give you an idea of what your um, the endurance strength uh, is going to be when you're doing the different calculation. So let's move on to look at the different stresses. So if your shaft has only vertical shear, so this 
only occurs close to the bearings if there is no torque being transmitted. Uh, then the tau is basic tau max is kt times 4v by 3a. So from distortion energy principle, the shear stress basically is 1 over square root of 3 times the tensile. So when you put all of these together, uh, we basically get the formula for d is 2.94 times kt times the vertical shear force v times n divided by sn prime. Uh, n here is a safety factor, so you can choose anything you want. Um, a, but basically, you basically be given this value when you're doing the formula. Uh, when you're doing pure reverse bending, there is no torsion at all. We can basically use this formula over here to calculate your uh, strength. If the shaft is in constant torsion alone, so this would basically be where there is no bending at all, then the formula basically becomes 16 root, through, root 3 times n by pi times t divided by sy, the whole to 1 by third. So this again is a formula if you have, um, this, all of this is actually given in the book. So the next step is if you have both bending and constant torsion, we use the bent failure criterion, so but experiments have actually shown um, that the Gerber criterion, this is the Gerber criterion, so experiments have shown that this equation over here actually uh, provides a better fit for the, the case where your uh, stress is, has both alternating and average component. So the bending force or the bending strength stress is given by M over S, where S is the sectional modulus, uh, and the torsion the torque is given by T or ZP. So for a solid shaft, this is the formula that we get. Since the yield strength Y sub S is SY over one third, so we, we can refer to section 12.6, the diameter basically becomes 32 by M times KT. Um, okay, let's. Um, there's no point reading of this formula. So basically it becomes this formula over here. Um, so once you have that, we can basically use the preferred, the preferred um, the sizes in appendix. Keep keep in mind that the bearings would basically have, use a different standard. So once you get to the bearing chapter, uh, you can basically have an idea of what the bearing sizes would be. But nonetheless, you can just look at standard bearing sizes, and that will allow you to figure out the diameter that you would need. So we're almost done. So once you have that, there are a few other design considerations. So typically what will happen is when you have the gear, you would, uh, or sprocket or bearing, so you need to basically locate a sharp corner, like a shoulder, and then typically you end up using a sharp fillet with KT 2.5. So bearings typically have an entry section which has a smaller diameter, and then you press fit your bearing to this location over here. So here, so this section is gonna have a gentle fillet, this is going to be the shoulder, so this part is going to be the sharp fillet. So gears and sprockets, so they're going to basically use a key as well as a retaining ring. For the retaining ring, uh, if you're using profile key, it's going to be KT is two. If you happen to have at the sledge key, which is typically not used, you would use a KT of 1.6. Uh, you use a retaining ring, and for the retaining ring, your KT is uh, three, and then what you do is, once you calculate the diameter, you increase it by a factor of 1.06. So this kind of summarizes the different steps for the shaft design in the book. Uh, once again, this is chapter 10 in the mod book. Uh, if you're confused, we'll, in the next video, try to do an actual example that's worked out in the book. Thank you.